Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Good. Um, so first of all, before we jump right in, I wanted to just check with the audience. How many of you listen to podcasts? Whoa. How many of you listen every week? There you go. How many of you listen in more than one language? Woo. All right. See? See? Stats aren't wrong. Um, so yeah, so uh, anyway, that was that was cool. I'm gonna. I'm here. My name is Suzanne Reber. Um, I have been a member of GIJN, really pretty well from the beginning. So it is what it is. I'm the older, you know. That's that's all there is to it. I'm very excited. I'm still talking about things that I talked to colleagues about when we first got together in Copenhagen, talking about investigative reporting and the opportunities that we as investigative reporters have, because I was an investigative reporter, editor, at the CBC at the time. At the time, we were trying to figure out how do you get audiences through the news services, where you could get little tiny bits of the air, right? And it kept developing, but the opportunity was always there. Audio is a massive audience, has been, still is. So today, the focus is really on the growth of where we're at now, which is podcasting which is one of the most democratic things we've had to actually tell these incredible stories that we all do. And so today I'm really going to be speaking to colleagues Toledo and Chitra, who I've worked with both of them. They're both long-standing members. All of our projects sort of born of GIJM and those relationships. And I know you guys are all radical sharers, so that's kind of where our work started. So Toledo, tell us a little bit about yourself here at Experience Podcaster. And then we'll talk about the project we did together. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here among you. So I wrote this small part because I speak Portuguese and uh, you don't want to listen to me in that language. So <laughs> uh, I ventured into podcasting late, very, very late. I had started dyeing my hair white for years when I recorded my first podcast episode which might be good news for some of you who still have your original hair color. It's always time to launch yourself into the wonderful world of podcasting. I say wonderful because it's like nothing I've ever, ever, I've ever experienced so far in 40 years of journalism. It has been the biggest surprise of my career. Podcasting brings together some of the best features of other forms of journalism with something more. A good narrative podcast demands the same rigor as the investigative reporting often found in the best magazine or newspaper articles, the same search for a deep understanding of the facts and the need to find details that add flavor to the story. Like broadcasting, podcasting is for me a collective effort. You can do it yourself, sure, but the best results are often the work of many specialists. A good sound designer can bring your narrative to life in ways I couldn't even imagine. A scriptwriter can add attention and rhythm to the narrative so listeners are always paying attention to what you are saying. But most of all, podcast has the power to connect you to an, to an audience in ways I'm still trying to comprehend. If reading the newspaper is or was a habit, listening to podcasts is intimacy. People will stop you in the street, not because you are famous, but because they consider you someone they know, and know quite well, actually, a friend. It seems a little crazy, I know, but it's not. If you think about it, these people stopping you in the street spend more time with you every week than they do with their grandmother, or maybe even their mother. <laughs> and it's not just a matter of hours. You are inside their heads, literally, since most people listen using headphones. It's so close that you don't need to shout or even raise your voice like a radio announcer. Nobody else can hear you in that headset. It's very intimate, almost a confession. So your tone should be confessional, than pro more confessional than, pro than uh, professor professorial. 
you are telling, not preaching. You are sharing, not pontificating. You are among friends, and that's unique in podcasting. Wow. Awesome. Very good. <laughs> well done. Later. <laughs> Chitra. Um, again, we have met at various conferences, and you uh, at KBR had already started doing a lot of different podcasting, but we ended up working on a serial together. But talk to us about your connection to audio and how you got into podcasting, but also the desire to do, to do more with the media. I have been captured with audio storytelling since the beginning of my career. It was like 2001. I started in KBR, still in KBR now. KBR is Indonesia's largest independent radio news agency, also doing podcasts since 2018. So I've been falling in love with audio storytelling. It's for our imagination, like way, way better than watching TV or watching any visual, so because it leads to any imagination. And for KBR, podcast is also important because uh, it um, uh, it allows us to be more creative than doing the radio shows as well. So it's it's uh, like uh, Toledo said, it is for imagination, it's intimacy, and everything beyond visuals. Thank you, Chitra. So I'm going to first of all get my phone because I want to be a timekeeper. Make sure we stay on time. Um, I'm going to just step back a little bit. You can see that these folks really are passionate which is wonderful because I'm hoping that many of you, some of you might have already worked in some kind of audio, some of you might be thinking about it. Um, it there's, you, you gotta have a spark from somewhere and, and I know we're probably talking to folks who are very experienced, others who just might wanna get into it. So I'm gonna take us back to a little bit sort of like what is going on. As you guys all illustrated with your hands, we're now at hundreds of millions of people who have made a very deliberate decision, think about what has to happen if I've got my phone, which is the primary vehicle for this medium, of course. Um, I need to open it up, I need to choose my podcast app, I need to find the podcast, and I need to hit play. Therefore, by the time that person is, <laughs> Toledo's in my ear, I've already really decided, you know, I want to hang out with Toledo because he's a cool guy. So. Those decisions are all about the loyalty that then comes with that medium. So this is not a sort of, yeah, maybe I'll feel like it. You're making a decision to listen, and they're hitting play in the millions. And then when they hit that play, your job is to remember that you're talking to them directly, and that you now, because you're investigative reporters, have an opportunity to not only talk to them for three minutes, two minutes at the top of the newscast, maybe it's gonna be a series. Maybe it's gonna be five times 30 minutes, or six times 30, or in Toledo's case, five times 60. That's a lot of time. There's probably, apart from maybe getting a feature film, that's like two feature films, right? So I think we're gonna spend a lot of time with that audience, which is cool. Um, so in the US, obviously, a big driver at the beginning uh, and it's still growing. Um, a lot of people talk about saturation of the English market, but the reality is it's been growing even after the sort of, you know, we had a, a pandemic growth and a dip. It, it's still growing. But I think the big thing here for me is how many podcast people are listening to, right? That's actually the loyalty we're talking about, and you guys were clearly <laughs> part of the demographic because it's the numbers. There's a lot of different stats out there. If you do want to know like where some of the data comes from, you can, you can get in touch with me. It tends to be similar sources. Reuters Institute keeps a really good tab on this. Digital News Report, you can go find it. So sometimes the samples are not always the same. You know, this is a sample I think is interesting because since the last time we met, 2019, um, and at the time the sample was taken, look at the growth just between the heavy purple line and the, and the light one. So you can see it's just still always growing. These are different markets. Um, in, in, you know, I would say uh, you've got a cross-section there of European and, and Asia and various markets. Um, but this one, again, sorry for all the text, but it's important just 
do a li quick comparison. Almost all of these numbers are getting us over 50% <coughs> of the available audience, which tends to be measured of podcast listeners between the ages of 18 to 24, 18 to 36. So already, another big thing is you're skewing younger. So I know a lot of your bosses are always talking about, oh, we want to get a younger audience. Well, then podcasting is one way to do that. Um, so just saying. Um, and of course, we're really interested also, I don't know how many of you are here from the Middle East, in places where you have a lot of censorship, um, podcasting is still, at this moment, a way to get to your audience because as far as we know, um, people are, are listening and there hasn't yet been a lot of censorship. So I've done panels with Ramsey from Sout uh, in Amman, Jordan, and he talks a lot more about that. And if you have the opportunity to go to a region and, and hear from practitioners in that region, I think that's a really interesting place. Um, you know, there's other markets that would surprise you, um, that a lot of listeners in Saudi Arabia are really keen on podcasts, so maybe that has to do with, with uh, state sanctions. I really don't know that much about Saudi Arabia, but I just wanted you to know that from all over the world, there's this incredible growth. And as we were starting to look at partnerships, obviously Brazil and Indonesia are massive countries with huge audiences. So if you're getting a big chunk of that audience in those, in those countries, then you're getting a lot of listeners. So to get back to what does this all mean for you guys, and I just will keep saying it, and I'm going to say it next conference or whenever they invite me back, it's just a massive opportunity. And I don't know when it's going to be OK for you to get in or what it takes, but it's there for the taking. Um, and it's about storytelling, right? It's not just about your findings, your investigation, which you've worked so hard uh, to do. It's about truly connecting with that audience who actually really just wants to hear what you have to say. And where that comes in, where you might have to think about a little bit uh, different techniques and, and different ways of, of thinking about your story, is what kind of stories are, are going to make it for your podcast. And I'm really talking now about investigative podcast. So we're not talking about another massive audience, which is sort of more the chit chat show. And I am really talking about deeply reported, deeply immersive uh, storytelling that is possible in podcasting. And as what's sort of the secret sauce, and again, folks who've, who've been here, who've worked with me, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of the mantra. It hasn't changed. It's really about revealing things, which we know as you're going through your investigation, you're constantly finding things out. When you have that spidey sense and your stomach is saying, oh my god, I didn't know that, wow, then you know you have those reveals that the audience is just dying to hear. Often it's hidden from us. It's stuff that you know that the public doesn't, which is why they, they come to you. You are doing some of the most important work because you are truth finders and they rely on you to actually find stuff out that they can't, right? So it's, it's important to remember the mission, right? And that that's one of the reasons they're coming, is that, is that reveal. And also, they're coming to you because they want to know what you think. They might even want to know what you're feeling. And so you're giving a layer of your personality in the podcast that you might not originally feel totally comfortable with, but that is the connection, because you are so close to that person. Again, you're in their ear. It's incredibly intimate, and it's important to remember that. And also, what I love about investigative stories, and all of us stay in it because we know that these are plot-driven stories. A lot of stuff happens in these stories. But often, we leave it on the cutting room floor. We don't talk about the visual details and. I work with Stephen Gray, who's here as well. We're going to talk about his podcast. You know, the documents are giving you all those visuals. You know, there was a yacht racing out of this harbor. <laughs> People boarded that yacht with machine guns. You don't tend to be able to write all of that detail in, but in a narrative podcast, that is gripping. So we love that stuff. And also, you know, we work with surprises. You know the story. 
And I think often what, what I find when I talk to people coming to workshops or talking about their story, they would say, yeah, but you know, this story's been done. You know, it's already been in the newspaper. What could I possibly do that's new? And I always say, wait a second. You know more about the story than anyone else. Anybody coming to your podcast does not know what you know. So it's OK to hold back. It's OK to figure out the most effective way to tell that story. You're going to be talking to people who just don't know as much as you do. And so it's really important that those surprises, those, those cliffhangers that you can work with in podcasting, which you love in your Netflix series where they just make you watch that next episode and you just can't wait to binge that series. That's what we're doing um, with podcasting as well. Um, so Verified is the, the kind of work that, that I've done. It's an investigative serial. It started actually with an investigation um, with some of the ERP reporters who were here talking about organized crime. Um, we had four seasons in a short time. I'm just going to play this clip from uh, season three, which was one of our most global stories. Racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists are metastasizing around the world. And we are definitely seeing an absolute uptick on that. White people will be on the road to like literal extinction over my dead body. Extremists are learning from each other and recruiting every day for their global fight for white power. We are currently in the process of gathering like-minded people throughout the world. We're pretty flat-footed. We have no handle on how big these groups are. That's um, an iron cross with my wife's name in it. To those guys who recognized us as terrorists, our ideas are what makes us dangerous. You know, he's a terrorist in the United States, but, but he says in Russia he's not. If I get killed because I was talking too loudly about the dangers this presents, they're worth being prepared. Uh, so yeah, that was season three of Verified. Um, it was six episodes of a deeply reported original investigation that was sort of a post-January 6th question that we all had in our newsroom. So what is going on? Who are these people? Uh, but within a few um, months, we realized that we, as our team, was going to focus on the global side of the story. So a lot of other teams in the US, there were some really great podcasts that came out documenting the January 6th folks, um, wh who they were all, all were, where they came from. We really focused on the sort of global movements that were actually fueling the extremism and how that all transpired. And as a, as a feature of this story, my colleague and, and reporter, uh, Mark Greenblatt, who had up to this point never investigated extremism because he is the son of a Holocaust survivor and he had spent his whole career saying, I'm never going to do any stories about Nazis. Um, and we changed that. And we actually, through a lot of um, conversation, we, we decided that to make his personal story and his quest to finding out more about uh, where his family had come from in Ukraine um, was, was actually part of the story that I think allowed listeners to understand um, some of the issues and, and some of the historical stuff that we were dealing with. And then, of course, I love to talk about Verified Season 1 because, again, it was born of um, this conference working with uh, Julia, Chechi, Alessia from IRPI. Uh, we came up with this story that they had actually, again, reported. It had been printed in 2015 of this very dangerous um, predator in, in Italy who was drugging and raping people who were coming to his house and staying on his uh, couch through couch surfing. So um, it was one of the most successful series that we did in Underverified um, because it spoke to that audience that I just want to mention is one of the biggest audiences inside the podcast community, which is true crime. Now, maybe some of you <laughs> have issues with that. It's a bit icky. However, what we did with Verified Season 1 is we we took true crime and we twisted it because the story was entirely about the survivors, not the bad guy. Of course, he was in there, but it was really about these women who banded together to uh, bring their rapists to justice.
In ancient times, people were killed by the gods and sent to the worst kind of hell for betraying the trust of a guest. So I was thinking I'd love to go to Venice next. As we don't have such a big budget, we look out for couch surfing. He says he's a policeman. He was wearing a tank top and he had these tattoos. His eyes, they didn't seem natural. He also has a lot of reviews. They're all very positive and he was very verified. Getting close to this case, it was shocking, deeply twisted. I saw him pouring white powder, but I, st I still drank the tea. Call me stupid. I said to myself, okay, now it's time to take care of this business because it cannot end like that. You crossed the wrong woman. The wrong women. <laughs> so um, a, an aspect of this world of podcasting, we're talking long form, uh, we talk about these stories having a long tail. And what that really means is your series comes out People are still discovering, we were just talking about that at breakfast today, constantly discovering your series because you're picking up audience organically all the time. So if you nurture that audience and if you have a feed, like sadly, we have not been renewed for season five. The feed is kind of dry right now. I'm trying to see if I can get the show back. However, during the time when we did these four seasons back to back and quickly, you just keep growing that audience. And so that audience in that feed is looking for the next thing. So even if we are doing feed drops or sharing audience with other podcasters, which is a thing that we talk about in the, in the more distribution side, we share that audience. So even if I put something in there sort of saying, hey folks, a new Wondery show is coming out. Why don't you take a listen to Who Killed Daphne? I'm going to still pick up whatever, 50,000, 60, whatever the downloads are for that episode, they're going to come and they're going to count in my feed. So it's very organic. And I also want to say that a lot of these stories have potential beyond the podcast. So even if you've already done them as a print story, you've already won awards, you do the podcast, it's a new way to touch the story. And I need you to think that it isn't the same. And so even if you have to wait to, to do it, it may still be worth it. Um, and we are now, I can't talk much about it, but we are now going to have a documentary series coming out that's on Verified Series 1 that will be going out as a, as a, you know, as a documentary um, streaming type thing. So it, it kind of breathes and lives on, um, which is really cool. So I'm not going to play this trailer, but in Season 2 we actually dealt with um, Johnson & Johnson, who just for 50 years happened to keep the secret that talc might have issues, that there were scientific questions about uh, the carcinogenic nature of talc. Um, but again, this was a story that Reuters uh, reported on very well. The New York Times did a series and Verified was actually, we're all reporting it at the same time. Because, of course, the women that I focused on in our series, the characters, were the ones who, by taking this company, this massive global giant to court, were actually bringing out the documents that allowed us to then figure out who was the first case, and we profiled the story from that point of view. So there's always an entry point that's going to be different than what your colleagues might be doing. So at the heart of it, I've just talked about the characters. And this is sometimes maybe the toughest thing with uh, reporters who are very experienced coming to the medium is just starting to talk about how important it is. It's, it's not even just, oh, I, you know, there's 40 people in my story. We've talked to all of them. That's great. But they're not all going to show up in your show because you can't possibly, as an audience member, you can't digest it. So partly it's like, who are the characters? What's the best way to find the arc? And so I'm always talking about that because it's just so critical. And that sometimes means you have to leave things out, you know, and that's how it is. But it's, it's exciting because then once you do cast your show and figure out, like, what's the best way, you really get to know those people. And I just want you to always think about this is the audience that you're doing this for, right? 
they're the ones who are going to get the rewards uh, if you really think about who the characters are. So uh, obviously another thing we talk a lot about is structure. We're going to get into that with these shows that we did together. So we do a lot of sort of building the structure. These are the um, little stickies from Verified Season 1 that were on, our, on my office window, moving things around, trying to figure out what's the right sequence of scenes. And then now we're getting into the heart of what is the new thing that I think we another opportunity, which is A, the growth of these markets, individually as, as podcasters in your markets, continuing to do that work, build that audience, but also what's exciting to me now is the multilingual space. I haven't put a lot in here with the companies that are doing it. Um, there's different ways that are going, they're going about it. Uh, companies like Wondery, that Stephen and I worked with, they are doing a lot of dubbing at the moment, you know, where they're taking a show, relaunching it with new voices. Other people are doing original productions in multi-languages. So this is going to be growing, so hopefully <laughs> the next time we meet, we're going to be talking about that part because that's a whole other opportunity. Like, so maybe your market isn't the biggest one in Scandinavia. But as we know from colleagues in Norway who worked with the BBC, releasing podcasts in both languages immediately grew their audience. So in the last, since, I guess, since Stephen and I met at Arige in 2019, we got together, um, we did the story of Daphne Caruana Galizia, very dramatic, incredibly important story that Forbidden Stories and others worked with Stephen to document and the podcast has done extremely well. That one is in English, so we're not going to talk all that much more about it because we really want to focus on some of the, the global um, podcasts. I just released one with um, Swiss Info, which is the digital side of Swiss Broadcasting, in French with partners in um, Paris. So that one, again, trying to take some of the gritty stuff that we do in investigative reporting about money laundering but actually just focusing on the story of some of these crazy scandals that we've all heard about, um, going right back to the history of how did money laundering even start. And it <laughs> started with the American mob who needed to figure out how to get the money that they were making in the casinos out of the country and literally decided to bring it to Switzerland and stick it in some banks, virtually in the suitcase. So the first episode is called The Suitcase Carriers. So um, not maybe everybody's cup of tea to look at this kind of niche story of, of, of money laundering, but the show's doing really well. Got into the top 10 in, in France, so it's like, okay, people still want to listen to really gnarly, tricky stuff. Okay, now we're going to get into um, these two projects that we individually worked on together, and I'd like to show you a trailer from Disclose, which is the podcast that we worked on with Chitra and her team. Can you play it? itu saya sih diem aja itu ya gimana sih perasaan saya tuh sebenarnya hancur waktu itu hancurnya apa yang lihat teman-teman saya masih sekolah gitu masih bermain kalau saya maju ini kakak kan udah Okay, so in a, in a few minutes, we're going to talk directly to Chitra about, about the work and some of the workflow, the things that we, we kind of learned doing, doing it. Um, and now I'd love if, if you could, Victor, uh, play the clip from uh, our project that we did with Toledo, and you can talk a little bit more about the title, because I know it's kind of a, an interesting name. Do you want to just say one thing before we hit the clip? Yes. Um, it doesn't make any sense in English, but I will try <laughs> to translate it. Uh, with 
the, the name in, in English would be the kidnapping of the yellow jersey. The yellow jersey is the national team, football national team of Brazil, with the most iconic image of Brazil besides the Christ. And uh, it was really quit kidnapped by the bosses of FIFA and CBF, which is the Brazil's FIFA. And that's the story about corruption in football, the most important sports in the world and in Brazil. Okay. How did Piauí? Olá, eu sou o Fernando de Barros e Silva e este não é o Foro de Teresina. A partir de agora, você ouve o Sequestro da Amarelinha, uma série em cinco capítulos, coproduzida pela Piauí, a Suíça Info e a Rádio Novelo. Os meus amigos José Roberto de Toledo e Jamil Chad vão te contar um pouco das coisas erradas do mundo do futebol. Sigam aí! O Opa, Jamil, saiu do trem? Tô saindo, tô saindo, Toledo. Olha, o trem atrasou, mas chegamos. Não, como assim? O trem suíço atrasou? Toledo, isso acontece sim, meu caro. Parece que não, mas, mas deixa eu deixar claro aqui. O atraso de 30 segundos. Ah, bom, um atraso suíço, tá certo. E você tá na estação ainda, não? Tô, tô na estação, na verdade eu tô saindo do trem aqui, é uma estação que fica bem no centro da cidade, Toledo, mas é, tô ainda saindo do trem. Me dá só uns três, quatro minutinhos e eu chego lá na loja de cofres, né? Ah, beleza. E a encomenda tá na mão? Relaxa, tá aqui na mão, tá aqui na mão. Quanto tempo você demora, você falou uns três minutos até a, da estação até o cofre? É uma, é uma caminhada é, bastante curta, porque você imagina que esse trajeto específico tinha que ser rápido. Imagina que situação, carregar sei lá quantas... Mas, sim, eu vou passar isso para o Toledo. Eu acho que foi uma das mais divertidas cenas. A opening scene uh, of your podcast, whatever you end up choosing with your team, é a coisa mais importante. So I, I'm very proud of some of the things that it takes often a lot of time to figure it out. But for this one, you know, having an actual real live item going into a safe that was a real life safe, having the guy basically say, you can put everything in here you want except for guns. I, I mean, that sticks with me forever. Anyway, I'm going to hand it over know. to you. And, you. and why don't you take it from there, Toledo? Yeah, let's go. Yeah. So let me... All right, there you go. So, uh, Suzanne and the good people from Swiss Info came to us with a mission, which we, was more like a problem. Uh, they wanted for, to create a narrative podcast about money laundering. <laughs> I don't need to explain how boring this is. In Brazil and Switzerland, and could not be some just a mention about Switzerland should be really about Switzerland and Brazil. Well, uh, it should involve journalists and in interviewees in both countries. The audience must be Brazilians, therefore the podcast would be in Portuguese. Uh, it was a partnership between three actors, Swiss Info, a magazine Piauí, it's a magazine like a, the New Yorker of Brazil, kind of. <laughs> and Rádio Novelo, which is a podcasting producer, uh, producing company. So, and preferably someone wants to hear that. <laughs> uh, that was the problem. So, we managed to find a solution. And this was to create a podcast about how FIFA the main structure of football. Uh, FIFA bosses turned the world's most popular sport football in a corrupt billion dollar machine. Why? Because it, we imagine, would attract an audience that likes football. So, big audience in Brazil, much bigger than the, an audience that would like to listen about Modern Laundry. <laughs> the main characters in this story 
are Brazilians and Swiss. The reporters that we were working together already have written books about it. The Swiss Info reporter Jamil Chad is a Brazilian who lives in Switzerland and ha has written a book about corruption in FIFA. And the other reporter, Alain Abreu, who works for Piauí magazine, had written a book about one snitcher that was crucial for the FBI case against the Swiss, uh, the, the FIFA bosses. So we already have a good beginning. We just had done mm, not much of the investigation, not all of it, but a good part of it. And of course, talking about football is telling an emotional story beyond figures and lawyers. So the plot that we've created the, had to had a, a dramatic arc and there are too many uh, characters so we have to find, and Suzanne was very uh, important in that part, to choose the right ones and the few ones. So the podcast begin with that scene that you've heard in Portuguese and didn't understand anything, but uh, <laughs> uh, it was the reporter, Jamil, going through the, the train, the train station, walking down the street to the safe uh, box uh, shop, exactly the same one, the same train, the same time of the day that Brazilians, corrupt uh, Brazilians, did the same tra trajectory with a couple, couple million dollars in diamonds in their pockets. So he rented uh, a safe in this same, same shop, uh, safe shop. The guy just said two things. Uh, I, don't know want, I don't want to know what you are going to put inside the safe. Don't tell me. And you must pay cash. <laughs> no trail, no paper trail. So, um, and then we did. We put the, the, the yellow jersey inside the, the, the safe. And, well, the, the, this is more like why we are telling the story and why it's important for Brazilians. And this is what we think would be the hook to the audience not to forget about it. Uh, football in, in Brazil is more than the national sport, is kind of a drama. Um, and it starts with a tragedy. Uh, in 1950, the World Cup is, was in Brazil. And uh, Brazil was doing wonderful uh, in the competition. And up to the final, the final match, Brazil just needed a draw. Zero, zero will be fine. And we lost to Uruguay. And it was a national tragedy that marked the, the history of the country in a way that they decided to change the color of the national team. Because, you know, white, it's bad luck. Let's try <laughs> another color. So that's why the yellow shirt is so impossible, so important. And uh, the next World Cup in Switzerland, Brazil was wearing the yellow shirt. So, and uh, it was so much a tragedy that the biggest football player that ever lived, Pelé, I know Messi, Maradona, doesn't <laughs> compare. <laughs> uh, Pelé uh, was eight years old when Brazil lost to Uruguay and he saw his father who was also a football player weeping and he didn't understand why and uh, his father said we lost this is a tragedy why are you crying no, those Uruguayans you know don't, 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 uh, I'll, 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 I will give you retribution just wait some years and he did. So in 1958, Brazil becomes world champion in Sweden. 
and then three more, uh, two more titles. The first uh, country to have three titles, and uh, they gave they gave us this illustrious cup, which somebody stole, <laughs> and it's true. And um, so this is the tragedy. Uh, how important football is in Brazil. So uh, because of that victory. Juan, Juan, uh, Juan uh, Jean Avelange, which is uh, some Belgian that happens to be born in Brazil, uh, took FIFA as president in, uh, because of the success of the old jersey, because of the su success of Pelé, and start transforming FIFA and the biggest sports organization that the world uh, has ever seen, a billion dollar company, and in a very corrupt way. So this is the story of the football, the story of how football became a major business, and how a Brazilian FIFA has uh, is situated, is located in Switzerland. Uh, as all the other sports associations. You can imagine why. And uh, even all uh, FIA, the automobilism, as, as you say that, uh, who doesn't run any races in Switzerland is based in Switzerland. So, and uh, so this is the story of, about corruption and how this model that this Brazilian in Switzerland created with major companies, sponsorships, and exported this corrupted model to other nations. So that's, and this was just possible because of the television. In 1970, when Brazil wo uh, won the third title, it was the first color satellite transmission of the World Cup. And then it grew up an audience of four, five, six billion people. So uh, it ends with something that would uh, look like a good end, the, with some snitching and people going to jail. But what we try to show in the in the podcast is that it was change to not change. Uh, just as we say in Portuguese, it will translate very badly, but I will try. Um, <laughs> it just changed the flies. The object that they are around is the same uh, and doesn't smell very well. So, uh, <laughs> and at the end, at the last episode, we just tried to project what was going to be with this corrupt structure that has been created. And uh, at the time, we didn't know what was going to happen in Qatar, but uh, we, were, we had a good idea that betting companies would be the most important actors in this corrupt scenario. And Unfortunately, it was exactly what had happened. So I'm trying to go further here. Uh, doesn't matter. Th those are the, the chapters. I won't say anything else about them. Just look at how long they were. Uh, too long, maybe. <laughs> and uh, so those, these is, are the casting. Uh, 27 people involved. Two presenters. We this the I just like to say two words about it. We like to be a very um, football-like show, so we have two presenters co-presenting as a uh, round table, as we say in Portuguese, about football, which is very common on Sunday nights. So it was almost the same feeling. Three reporters, three directors, three producers, and blah, 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 blah. And uh, the setup, uh, 26 original, original interviews, which were very, very important, not just to tell the story, but to 
us to understand the topic, six hours of recording, countless hours of production, editing, and post-production. We started in February 2021, two to three months with the bureaucracy, you know, Switzerland, Brazil. <laughs> And production and interviews and scripting goes from May to October. Then the narration and recording, the editing, post-production, all done in November. We launched uh, in December 2021. And we launched in November 2022 because of the World Cup. We did a sixth episode about Qatar. And uh, that's it. Uh, one thing that uh, five one-hour episodes blew, uh, and another extra episode the following, week, following year. A new episode every week, same day of the week, same time, same minutes. It's very, very important to be precise, not because of the Switzerland, Switzerland side, but just because people are waiting for it. And this is important. Uh, I do a weekly podcast, political one, uh, an hour show too. Uh, so we have already had this channel, this feed with 100,000 plus subscribers. So we used that channel to launch this new podcast in the same feed. After that, we've relaunched in uh, another feed of, of itself, uh, but the main audience came from this channel that already existed, which is very, very important. And if you have the possibility to do it, I would really recommend it. And uh, so that's the final, I promise that's the end. <laughs> the total audience was 605,000. No, 600, I have problems with numbers in English. Yes, 74% in Spotify, I know, terrible. And uh, that's the audience by episode. The first episode had much a bigger audience, 127,000. Then it dropped to this. It's very funny because the last episode grows again because people want to know how it ends. And the, the sixth episode that was launched a year later uh, got more or less the same in its own feed. The two-thirds male, because of football in Brazil still is a, a male sport, although there are lots of very good male players. We've never won a World Cup. And uh, the audience is a little bit older than we it's expect 35 to 44 years old was the the main the main uh, age. That's it. Thank you. All right. Um, is my mic on? Okay. Um, I will actually hold my questions to you till later because there are some things I think it would be great to follow up on. Um, but I'd love to just hand it over right now to Ch Chitra and, and her team. Um, we work together uh, actually under the auspices of GIJN. GIJN um, has an advisory, uh, sorry, a, a consulting arm, small but mighty. And um, Anne Koch, who's at the conference, uh, was running that and had um, put out an all call. Chitra put in her bid and one, and guess what? We ended up doing a podcast together. So do you want to talk a little bit about, about um, your show? Thank you so very much, Susan. So this is the uh, podcast that we did together with Susan as the coach, the same shirt as I'm wearing that right now. So uh, as Susan mentioned, it's a part of the IGN program. Uh, so it's um, a GIGN's a way to support watchdog, watchdog journalism. And they were asking us what kind of program that we want to create because they will support us all the way. So we uh, discussed it for several Zoom meetings. It was during the pandemic. And we decided to do something um, 
very uh, close to home, which is podcast, and we wanted to do an investigative podcast. Bear in mind that in Indonesia, people don't listen to podcasts. People watch podcasts because uh, they usually access podcasts on YouTube as visual, uh, audio, audio visual thing. So we are doing this uh, as an audio only investigative, uh, and the see the podcast scene in Indonesia is mostly entertainment. So it's a very big uh, thing for us to do it, uh, and uh, also in mind that uh, the the other genres popular are horror, comedy, and melodramatic monologue. So it's uh, one thing that we try we push hard to reach out the audience. This is where the links to where you can find the podcast. So uh, I would like to introduce to the one of the main characters that we listen to a half of the series. We have six episodes, uh, and Rasmina is the main character for the first three episodes because she was the one who pushed for the change of the law. Um, in Indonesia, the marriage law um, states that girls uh, can marry at the age of 16, while boys at 19. So she was the one pushing for the bar, the, for the minimum age to raise from 16 to 19. So we'll have a listen to just to have a feel of what the podcast is. di Mohon Berdiri, Yang Mulia Majelis Hakim Konstitusi memasuki ruang persidangan. Delapan Hakim Mahkamah Konstitusi satu persatu masuk dan duduk di deretan kursi Hakim. Mereka menghadap ke arah pengunjung sidang yang hadir di sidang terbuka ini. Sidang dibuka dan dinyatakan terbuka untuk umum. Sewaktu di sidang juga saya tuh, Pak, gimana gitu? Bilangnya saya yang ntar ditanya apa? Udah, Mbak mah diem aja. Biar saya aja yang ngomong, katanya Mbak mah kalau ditanya tuh biar iya-iya aja gitu, ya udah gitu. Tapi tetap aja, Mbak. Gimana gitu, pikiran saya tuh kacau balo gitu. Yang lihat apa kak? Uh, skip the second clip so we can start uh, discussing also about the uh, podcast. So the starting point for this podcast is um, so KBR is a radio news agency. We do mostly news production and news programs, bulletins. We don't have a dedicated investigative team. So it's a big challenge from GIJN to do this podcast series on top of other things. So we started brainstorm. We started with a small dedicated team. We, who also do other things as well on their daily job. And we did some brainstorms and we started what, with uh, what Susan mentioned as a, a helicopter view, a topic. Um, and then we push ourselves to find the story, not just the topic. Uh, and then we, because we needed a story with a lot of depth, we need the character, we, we need to speak to the audience and uh, with the stories, and we have to also deliver what's new about the story. So uh, one thing that we also learned during the discussion with Susan is also the difference between the topic and the story. Topic is the helicopter view, the story is when you really find the character and the story of the character. That's why the character is the one that we have to fall in love with. Uh, and then we, uh, we came down to two topics uh, when we discuss it uh, with the mental health for youth and also the child marriage. Both are very close to the team and then we decided to do this child marriage cases because when we were doing our research, we found that <coughs> like a, in monthly basis, there are at least one child marriage case rise on uh, uh, the media. And what we learn about these cases are it's always a tip of the iceberg. So who knows? how big are the, uh, the numbers. And we just had this uh, law revision happen in the end of 2021, and we started doing this in 2022, and we still see new cases coming for child marriages. So we decided, so this is the one that we're going to do the story on. This is how we do the uh, characters building. We talk to all the people, we deep dive with the stories, we have this principal stories, uh, uh, principal sources, and we explore everything we would like to know about the, the characters, and then we name them our characters because they are the one who will deliver the stories. At this moment, when we did this uh, post it kind of thing, we didn't know who would go first, who would go second, uh, blah, 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 but we just do explore all the stories uh, from all these characters. 
So this is, I think we kind of copy what Suzanne did with the sticky notes on her wall. And we <laughs> do this uh, on a Google Jamboard. So we jot down all the stories from this character. What kind of things that uh, cross our minds. Just put it there and then we discuss it over Zoom and we yeah, move around things, how we are going to deliver these stories. Finding the cliffhanger moments. At this moment, again, we didn't really know that we wanted to do six episodes. We just like, okay, go with the flow and of a, a deep dive with the characters. Like the, the cliffhanger moments also for emotional experiences because we're going to tell stories. It's not just um, showcase of facts, like uh, Suzanne always reminds us, it's a story that you want to tell to uh, the audience. And also, uh, the last point is um, also crucial in every discussion with uh, Suzanne is what's the best tape. Because this is, uh, we have really to uh, prioritize tapes that we want to put in the story. And also the narrative writing. We learn about the narrative uh, interviewing and also do the narrative uh, writing. Only the best stuff gets in the show. This is uh, a constant reminder from Suzanne as the coach. And also it's not a news piece because we are very used to doing news bulletins, news program, news uh, talk shows and everything. But it's a different thing for us. So, so it's, it's, it's quite challenging uh, for the team as well. And we, and we have uh, internal discussion with, uh, besides what we have with Suzanne, we, where we discuss, uh, is it emotionally driven already, the characters? Are, are we giving um, rooms for the characters to thrive, not just uh, a list of data and everything? Uh, so uh, we created the beat board to help us uh, uh, grow with the arc, the story arc. And um, what uh, Suzanne mentioned is the vomit graph like just pour everything into the draft and then later on we uh, look at it again and try to uh, find the best thing out of this. And also uh, doing the podcast, that uh, something that we learn very deeply uh, from this is it's not just about doing the podcast production, it's how you deliver the story to the audience and that includes promotional activities that we have never done before. Usually we just do social media posts we uh, reduce that, give it to the social media team, and then wish them all the luck for <laughs> the podcast to reach the audience. Good luck. <laughs> but that's not how we did with uh, this code because we did so much hard work. It's not fair just to give it just to, for the social media team and wish them good luck. So we started the discussion for promotional activities since the very beginning. This is something that we haven't done before. Uh, and also, uh, we're not just doing um, the uh, traditional boost post on social media and everything, but also we map out our connection, our journalist friends who would be happy to help us through the promotional activities to share the same values, the same drive to push for this kind of thing uh, to reach the audience. And also, um, we even uh, go with to Spotify and trying to reach out for them to get them support. Uh, at the end of the day, we didn't, but then it's still something that we tried. I was kind of reluctant. Do we really want to do this? <laughs> but okay, let's just do it. <laughs> and then we did, but it didn't happen, but it's okay. And uh, it's also the first time for us to create an impact tracker from the very beginning, because we want to uh, that our hard work pays off with all the activities uh, that we did. One of the uh, activities that we love so much doing the podcast, and this is something also that we learn from the uh, coaching, is the table read. This is something that we usually see on filmmaking, but this is also something that we did uh, during the podcast. It's quite scary for us because it's like, although the people who listen uh, at the table read is our friends, our close friend in the newsroom, it's still something scary because we will get instant reaction from them, whether the ah, the ooh, or the, the no, or the, any reaction uh, is quite scary for us. But we did all the table reads for all six episodes, and it's very uh, rewarding for us to have the instant uh, reaction from them. And that also allows us to give 
room for improvement for the scripts, for the reading, and everything. And finally, the schools went live on uh, last year, on August 22nd. And we, as we, I mentioned before, we did a lot of things that we haven't done before with the promotional activities. This is the the day-to-day -day our social media activities, doing the pod, uh, uh, promotion on social media, doing the audiogram, behind the scene, the teaser, blah, blah, blah. This is something that we commonly do. We also have interns when we are doing, and they also give inputs, insights. It's I think it's important to work with interns because they're young and we, we get the chance to pick their brain and what will make this kind of story works for young audience like them. So one of the promotional activities that we did are uh, the ideas of uh, from the interns. And this is also from the interns as well, the collaboration with community and influencer who care about the topic, who care about child issues, child marriage issue, or educational issues because it touches upon uh, also on educational issues as well. And this is also something that we the first time for us, reaching out for to our close friend, who is also a lecturer, uh, who to write an opinion piece on uh, the uh, and the opinion piece was uh, released on the biggest uh, newspaper in Indonesia. So uh, he's talking about the innovation in journalism, and he include uh, disclose the investigative podcast as one of the innovation that uh, journalism could do in Indonesia. So it's a a good boost for uh, the podcast itself. And we also collaborate with other media. This is also something that we haven't done. Usually we just, um, it's like more like a casual conversation. Oh, we did this podcast, blah, blah, blah. But we actually reach out to them to uh, help us to promote this uh, podcast to reach the, uh, their audience, which also uh, we uh, share the audience with us as well. Uh, because KBR started uh, as a radio news agency, we have a network of uh, our own. We also reach out to community radio network in West Java. Uh, West Java is the province uh, with most case, one of the most cases of child marriages in Indonesia. So we reach out to community uh, radio stations to also uh, play the podcasts and their stations and reach out to their audience. We also collaborate with universities to tell these stories because investigative podcast is something new for university students. Usually they, once again, watch a podcast on YouTube and also just um, uh, know about the, the formats. It's only the talk show kind of thing, the monologue, but not investigative podcast. So it's important to reach out to a young audience as well uh, in terms of how we produce this kind of investigative podcast. Uh, we also push forward the, the issues of um, this child marriage and uh, President Joko Widodo uh, from Indonesia also shouts for child marriage uh, prevention in one of the uh, government meetings. Uh, uh, it was towards the child's, uh, uh, child's Day in Indonesia. So this is the next for this close. Uh, if you see in the middle, uh, Rasmina, the main character of um, this close passed away a couple of weeks ago due to uh, cancer, and we dedicate this story for uh, her, of course. And and the the left uh, you see Rasmina, the last victim, is the English adaptation of the podcast "Forced to Marry," our version, and we uh, collaborate with Puma Podcast to in the Philippines to do the adaptation uh, to English to reach out the uh, uh, to global audience. And we are also brewing the seventh season for this class. Thank you. Yay. One thing I get to say, because I was working with both of you, is it was also a lot of fun. Um, I Two takeaways. Working with a team in Brazil, knowing that we could actually have almost like a satirical approach in some of your banter, that was for me a really big learning that every culture obviously has a different tolerance for like what is an acceptable way to talk about really serious stuff. And I thought that was something that really stuck with me, just how much fun you guys were having as the hosts, um, you know, with the material. And then in terms of, you know, what was the big aha moment for me with working with your team is again, 
I know how important music is. I know that the sound designer is your best friend. But I got completely blindsided by not knowing anything <laughs> about gamelan, right? Um, so some of the music choices that um, the team made, I, I just, my brain couldn't literally deal with it because of the, the beats and rhythms that in Western world, we grow up with certain rhythms and we are used to them and we don't realize how much we internalize them. So I remember the first mix, I was just like, I don't know if this is good or not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so those are just two little uh, moments of the cross-cultural part. And if you are working with teams from different countries, of course, the key is to keep an open mind. Everybody is coming to it with a different culture and different history. But what connected us here was we just wanted to do the best possible show we could, right, in the time we had. 